Gracious God, here we are. It's Christmas Eve. Our hearts are full, and yet we are mindful of the great need around us. God, above all else, we need the gift of you, of your presence in our lives. So God, I pray that during this time as we come together around your word, that we will feel your presence, that we will experience your peace. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Our first scripture today is 1 John 4, 9. This is how the love of God is revealed to us. God has sent His only Son into the world so that we can live through Him. And from Luke 2, 13 through 20, finishing off the Christmas story from the Gospel of Luke. Suddenly, a great assembly of the heavenly forces was with the angel praising God. They said, glory to God in heaven and on earth, peace among those whom he favors. And when the angels returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go right now to Bethlehem and see what's happened. Let's confirm what the Lord has revealed to us. They went quickly and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. When they saw this, they reported what they had been told about this child. Everyone who heard it was amazed at what the shepherds told them. Mary committed these things to memory and considered them carefully. The shepherds returned home, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. Everything happened just as they had been told. I read an article recently in Psychology Today. It caught my attention with this opening line. The holiday season is filled with gifts and empty of what people really want. The article went on to say that Americans are facing a loneliness crisis that has led to a public health epidemic. See, loneliness doesn't just impact our mood, it impacts our health. And considering that over 42 million people surveyed identified themselves as lonely in a study that didn't even include people under the age of 45, this would seem to be a rather widespread problem, especially in a season where we are peer pressured into being merry. So, what are we doing about it? Well, author Dr. Emma Sapala suggests that we're going about it all wrong, especially this time of year. She says we're trying to fill that void with stuff to the point that we are, as she says, inundated with stuff. Stuff we like, stuff we don't like, stuff we re-gift, stuff we end up throwing away inevitably at some point. Think about it. How many things in your house can you really hang on to forever or you even want to hang on to forever? Probably not more than a handful. And yet, we keep insisting on buying things, exchanging material goods, she says, as if that can somehow make up for what we truly long for. Connecting, kindness, love, meaningful, non-technology-driven exchanges. Now, I get her point, but I don't think that we've gone quite this far, have we? I mean, most of us have gifts under the tree, but we're also going to manage to be kind and connect and be loving to one another. If we make it to a family gathering or two, we might just, enough, just exchange enough hugs to last us a month. Thank God the years of pinching cheeks are behind us. Who, who has been under the wrong end of that one? Yeah. yeah. But there are still those who will insist... I'm planting big old smooches on our cheeks. The more lipstick, the better, right? Patricia, I'm looking at you. (laughs) You wear special lipstick just for that. I don't believe you. Now, I love giving and receiving gifts. I don't even mind shopping now that I can do it from my living room. I'll admit, though. But even though I find myself more excited about Christmas than ever these days, I'm not as into this exchange of material goods as I used to be, and I think I figured out why. See, when I was a kid, I remember exactly when I started counting down to Christmas. It was like clockwork to me. See, every July, my parents and my sister and my dog and I got in one car, and we headed for the mountains. And our good friends, the Wards, got in another car. 
We ended up in Bat Cave, North Carolina. It sounds way more exotic than it is. For a week, we did nothing more than eat and play and water ski and sail and swim on Lake Lure and sing on the front porch overlooking the creek as one family. It was a beautiful time. But there's one more thing that we did because the wards are actually professionals at this. We shopped. We started our Christmas shopping that week. See, the wards were determined to make us good shoppers. I still, I, I still haven't quite caught up with them on that. But we shopped. We started our Christmas shopping that week in July. And at the end of that vacation week, as we packed our cars and admired our suntan faces in the rearview mirror, that's when my Christmas countdown started. Looking back, I always thought I started to look forward to Christmas at that point because shopping had gotten me in the mood. But I figured out something now that I'm a little bit older, and it's this. I wasn't counting down to the gifts. I was counting down to the next time that all of us would turn off the rest of the world. When work and school and all those everyday routine responsibilities would release us and we could once again just be together. That's what I wanted. See, I didn't want presents as much as I wanted presents. Now, I've heard at least 40 sermons in the course, at least 40 sermons in the course of my lifetime about how Christmas isn't about gifts under the tree. And we even heard Drayley give another one today. And the last thing you need is another one of those good grief. Even Dr. Seuss got in on preaching this message, right? We get it. We get it. But I've been reminded this Christmas as we talk about those little miracles that we miss, that the little miracles that occur every day right before our mind, our eyes, are powerful, beautiful miracles. And one of those miracles is the miraculous gift of God's presence. So I don't bring you a message today about what not to focus on this Christmas. Instead, I bring you a message about the first miracle and the miracles that can work in our lives and in the lives that we touch today. See, God's first gift to humanity was His presence with us in the beginning. When the Spirit of God moved over the face of the earth and the Word of God gave shape to new creation, God breathed life into the first man and into the first woman. And Scripture tells us they walked together in the cool of the day so often that Adam and Eve knew the sound of his footsteps. But something happened. Sin crept in and built a wall between them, and God's presence became something that only a select few would experience. See, God never abandoned his creation, though, or his people. Kings and storytellers and poets shared stories passed down through generations of a God who set his bow in the sky as a sign of peace. A God who set the captives free and made a way through the desert to the promised land. But sin continued to add brick after brick to the wall. A few would come, we call them prophets, who would break down enough of that barrier to let the light through. But people can be so hard-headed and so very predictable. And the wall that sin built between God and us seemed insurmountable, indestructible. Maybe that's why God chose to come to us so far outside the walls, outside the story walls of the powerful city of Jerusalem, outside the gates of Bethlehem. I find myself at a loss for words when I considered what happened on that day. God The eternal, the all-powerful, the creator of the universe who breathed life into our lungs, God plunged into time. An intersection between the temporal and the eternal. He became flesh. He became one of us. And he didn't do this in some noble, powerful, dignified way. Scripture says that when shepherds found him, he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. He couldn't even move his arms or legs in that little baby straitjacket. And he was lying in a feed trough made into a temporary bed. The place smelled of animals. See, humans were the interlopers here. What child is this? They have to have been wondering, right? I mean, really wondering. And don't we wonder too? 
Would God really go to such lengths just to be present with us, just to be present for us? As Jesus grew, it became clear that there was something different about him. He walked the earth for three decades. Christians, Jews, Muslims, secular historians all attest to this truth. And almost universally they will agree that there was something special about him. And Mary was the first to know what that something was. She was the first to know the power of his presence. She was the first to know him as Emmanuel, God with us. And Jesus grew up to be a miracle worker, but so many didn't understand. They were looking for something big and flashy out of this rumored Messiah. But when God became flesh and lived among us, he showed his great love for us, not in massive displays of showmanship, but instead in his constant willingness to pause and pay attention to one person at a time. He was truly present wherever he went. Sure, there were plenty of other miracles along the way. He turned water into wine, healing after healing, feeding thousands upon thousands, walking on water, raising the dead. But the constant thread throughout Jesus' ministry was his ability to stop, to listen, to see, and to get straight to the heart. The constant miracle he brought was his presence. Don't you hope those people who crossed his path appreciated the gift? Don't you hope they realized how blessed they were to have seen him face to face, to have heard his voice? I wonder. But I also wonder if we realize how blessed we are today. Because just as Jesus promised his disciples, he did not leave us, not really. After his death and resurrection and ascension into heaven, the Holy Spirit was turned loose on us. And though we do not see his face, he is closer to us now than our next breath once we accept him as our Lord and Savior. In his presence, we are never alone. Never In His presence, we have hope even when all seems lost. In His presence, we have peace that passes all understanding. Peace that fills us and guides our steps. In Him, we have a joy that is our strength when we are weak. When happiness comes and goes, this joy of the Lord is our constant. In His presence, we begin to understand just how loved we are. All these things are ours because by the power of the Holy Spirit, Christ is present in us. And if you've been here more than once or twice, you know that I believe that Scripture calls for a response from us. And I love to drop a challenge. And so here it is. As with hope and peace and joy and love, God's given us this gift of presence so that we will pass it along. See, God is present for us, with us, and now we should be present for one another. I think we often struggle with believing that our presence is enough. I mean, what do we really have to offer? If you've ever paused outside a hospital room and wanted to stay outside because you were sure you didn't have the right words to say, you understand what I'm talking about. If you've ever sat with someone as they grieve the loss of a loved one, you understand. If you've ever held the cold, dirty hand of a person who's living on the street or perhaps even crossed the street to avoid a conversation, you've probably felt it. There's this feeling of inadequacy in us that's undeniable. We want so much to offer something that will be of help. We want to fix what's broken. And so often we can't, so we hang back. We say nothing. We do nothing. We withhold our presence. When are we going to learn that our presence is the first and best gift that we can give? It's true in the best of times, like summer vacations and Christmas mornings, and it's true in the worst of times. You know what? Here's the sad truth. You may never have the right words because honestly, I think the right words don't exist for so many of the situations we face. We may never have the resources or the skills or the know-how to fix what is broken, but we can show up. We can show up in the midst of the joy and we can show up in the midst of the brokenness and walk with people 
who are trying to make it through the valley and don't want to walk alone. That's what God did for us in Jesus Christ and that's what we can do for one another. I hope we realize what a miracle our, just our presence can be. I saw a story, it aired this past week, that illustrates the power of presence. And if you have tissues, you might want to get them out. I, I can't promise you won't shed a tear or two. But I just have to share this story with you today. I am a wife of almost 30 years a mom of eight biological children, and then we do medical treatment, foster care, and adoption of medically needy kiddos, and we've had seven of them come through our doors. Okay, so this is Charlie's room. We adopted him when he was 18 months old, and he wasn't even anticipated to live long enough to get adopted. And at this point in time, he's lived two years longer than that. Day to day, we live like he's living. When he actually is dying, then we will roll with what's necessary. In the meantime, we are living like Charlie is living. We sing songs to him, and we pick him up, and we dance, and he gets lotion, and he gets fed, and he's nurtured, and, and the kid is just living life. It's not all good, it's not all bad, it's not all scary, it's not all fearful, it's not all joyful. It's everything all together, and I don't make a difference for hundreds and hundreds of babies but I'm able to step into the lives of a few of them and make all the difference for that one. And this is where I've been able to thrive. There are tears and there's grief, but there's so much more joy and hope for his life. I have what it is that God gives me strength to handle. There are definitely situations where the baby just dies and they don't necessarily have a name and no one goes to a funeral and they're not, they're not missed and they're, and they're not loved and that for me is just not an option. I just am celebrating the fact that you even were able to live. And we're gonna be very sad when you go. But we're just gonna be more glad that you came. Miracle is defined by Merriam Webster as an extraordinary event manifesting divine intervention in human affairs. A miracle can't be explained not by natural or scientific laws, and I know you probably don't think of yourself as a miracle worker. But with God's help, when you give the gift of your presence, something truly extraordinary happens. Love, hope, Peace and joy flow through us. Don't get me wrong. I'm not knocking the stuff that will be under the tree in the morning in many of our houses. And I can't wait to share the gifts that I've wrapped. And I will confess that I have shaken some boxes and felt around to try to figure out what I'm getting. I am not on to y'all right now. But I am suggesting this. 
that we find time to be present for one another. I'm suggesting that we make it a special effort of ours, especially over this next week, to reach out to those whom God has put on your heart. See, I believe God has put somebody on your heart today that needs your presence right now. God's presence in you will give you all that you need, no matter what you're walking into. Now be present for those for whom God is calling to mind. Step into the lives that you can step into. For too long, this season has been full of gifts and empty of what people want. Well, I believe it's time we can do something about that. See, on the day that Christ was born, everything changed by His very presence. He showed us how far He was willing to go to meet us where we are. Through His teaching, He showed us the way that we should live, a way that led to peace with God and with one another. And this child who was placed in a feed trough made into a bed would become the bread of life. This child that offered hope and peace, was born in the shadow of the cross. That has to be my favorite addition to all the Christmas decorations. If you have not seen the manger and the cross together right outside this window, please take it in. It's beautiful. In that manger and on that cross, we saw how far God was willing to go to reconcile us to Him. And so today, as we come to the Lord's table, we are especially thankful That where two or more are gathered, Christ has promised to be with us. We are thankful for communion with God and with one another.